ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles. That's... <laughs> A new decade began in America, and already the country was seeing the end of a peaceful time being replaced with a turbulent new one. America saw the Cold War heat up as paranoia shook the country from Capitol Hill to the average working American home. The 1950s saw the country at its wit's end trying to destroy communism by means of the Korean War. But as the 1960s started seeing emerging leaders such as Mao Zedong and Fidel Castro, they were pushing the country to the brink of a new war. The most heartbreaking event was the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The American people were on low self-esteem and trust after almost two decades of rebuilding, but sought an escape in new forms of entertainment thanks to the golden age of television. Everything from cartoons to sitcoms filled the airwaves into television homes across America. There was one show that gathered almost every family in the States into the living room to watch together, and that was the toast of New York, The Ed Sullivan Show. Ed Sullivan was a visionary, bringing the freshest talents to homes across the nation. Everything from comedy to special talents were seen by all. However, his most groundbreaking guests were the newest artists in music. Rock and roll had officially become the hottest trend in popular culture, and Sullivan sought every act that he could so all of America could hear them. As 1964 would be coming to a close, he would be responsible for the most famous moment in television history. On February 7, 1964, the Beatles landed at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport, and on February 9th, The Ed Sullivan Show would showcase the Beatles for the first time on American television. This episode was watched by approximately 73 million viewers in over 23 million households. Beatlemania ran through the United States like a freight train. The older generation was not ready to give them their day in the sun. Even with their legions of young fans, they were criticized for the way they looked, by the way they talked, and of course the music that they played. It would only be a blip on the screen as they would embark on their first U.S. concert tour. Beatlemania erupted at the Washington Coliseum, and the following day they would return to New York for another strong reception during two shows at Carnegie Hall. They would then appear on The Ed Sullivan Show for a second time before another 70 million viewers before returning home to the UK. Beatles' first visit to the United States was a rejuvenation of a broken nation. For many, particularly the young, it reignited a sense of excitement and possibility that monumentally faded in the wake of the assassination of President Kennedy. This helped set the stage for another revolutionary series of social changes that would come in the decade. The popularity of the Beatles generated unprecedented interest in British music in the United States, which allowed the floodgates to open for a number of British groups to make their stateside debuts. The Dave Clark Five, The Animals, Petula Clark, The Kinks, and of course, The Rolling Stones, were able to pull the door off the hinges that the Beatles opened, and America's youth continued to allow music to change in their favor, regardless of its critics. The Beatles, however, would still wear the crown as the kings of the British invasion. During the week of April 4th, 1964, the Beatles held 12 positions on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart, including the top five. Being the hottest music act, this would only take them to the next level and everyone would want a piece. Capitol Records' reluctance to push the Beatles forward saw their competitor, United Artists Records, encourage them in their film division to offer the Beatles a three motion picture deal, primarily for the commercial potential of soundtracks in the United States. The Beatles would record their newest album, which would also include a separate soundtrack for their first feature film by the same name. Directed by Richard Lester, A Hard Day's Night involved the band for six weeks in March and April of 1964 playing themselves in one of the first of its kind, a mockumentary. The film premiered in London and New York in July and August, respectively, and United Artists released the official soundtrack in North America, combining the Beatles' songs with George Martin's orchestral score. The group's third studio album, A Hard Day's Night, contained the songs from the film on one side and new music on the other side. 
This would be a turning point in the band's musical direction as the sound would include their influences from their first two albums, mixed with bright and joyous original sounds filled with ringing guitars and irresistible melodies. To this day, this album would hail some of their most popular songs. There was no rest for the Beatles touring internationally in June and July. The Beatles staged 37 shows over 27 days in Denmark, the Netherlands, Hong Kong, Australia, and New Zealand. In August and September, they returned to the United States with a 30-concert tour of 23 cities. These concerts attracted between 10,000 and 20,000 fans to each 30-minute performance in cities from San Francisco to New York. In August, the Beatles would meet one of America's most influential music acts of the time, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan's audience was a much different group. They were college kids with artistic and intellectual learnings, along with a huge dawning for political and social idealism, very different from the teeny bopper crowd that the Beatles attracted. Within six months of that meeting, John would start to make songs that were heavily influenced by Dylan's style. After that, Bob Dylan would take a page right out of John Lennon's book and went electric. The Beatles were not only able to connect with their fans, but with different musical talents as well. This interaction would cause the Beatles to continue to evolve and get even more active in areas like politics. During their 1964 U.S. tour, the group was confronted with reality of racial segregation in the country of the time, particularly in the South. When informed that the venue on their September 11th concert in the Gator Bowl of Jacksonville, Florida was segregated, the Beatles said that they would refuse to perform unless the audience was integrated. Lennon stated that we never played to a segregated audience before and we are not going to start now. Their music showed tremendous growth in their fourth album, Beatles for Sale. It would show evidence of a growing conflict between the commercial pressures of their global success along with their creative ambition. It would also not be one of their more popular records given the challenges of constant international touring and would give them very limited times for songwriting. This resulted in the album having six covers to complete the album. It was the eight original songs that stood out, demonstrating the growing maturity of Lennon and McCartney's songwriting partnership. There was, however, other influence towards the Beatles and their new music, which was also controversial, and that was drugs. Bob Dylan introduced the Beatles to cannabis, but it was George's dentist who secretly added LSD to their coffee at a dinner in 1965. John described the experience as both terrifying and fantastic. Paul became the first Beatle to discuss LSD publicly, declaring it in a magazine interview that it opened my eyes and made me better, more honest, and a more tolerant member of society. She's got a ticket to ride. The Beatles will return to the big screen in color with their second film, Help. Meant to capitalize on the current James Bond film craze, Help was more or less a parody. The film received mixed responses among reviewers, but it was the soundtrack and the fifth studio album that would receive high praise. The official album would also contain the final two covers the Beatles would ever record in Act Naturally and Dizzy Miss Lizzy. The band expanded their use of vocal overdubs on Help and incorporated classical instruments into some arrangements, including a string quartet on the pop ballad Yesterday, composed and sung by Paul McCartney. That song, to this day, in regards to the Beatles, has only been performed by Paul and has inspired the most cover versions of any song ever written. The group's third U.S. tour opened with the performance before the world record crowd of 55,600 in New York's Shea Stadium on August 15, 1965. Towards the end of the tour, they would finally see how far they had come as they would meet their idol, Elvis Presley, who invited them into his home in Beverly Hills. That very same year, America saw the Fab Four in a whole new way with the launch of an American Saturday morning cartoon series, the Beatles that echoed a Hard Day's Night slapstick antics over its two-year original run. The series was a historical milestone as the first weekly television series to feature an animated version of real living people. Mid-October of 1965, the Beatles entered the recording studio for the first time with the time to make an album. It was a time the Beatles had been waiting for, a chance to finally make a complete album rather than a record filled with singles. It would also be the time for the band to take everything that they had learned from all their tours and all the people they encountered to truly present something different on their own. The first album of that group would be the 1965 release, Rubber Soul. 
the album would be hailed by critics as a major step forward in the maturity and complexity of the band's music. Their thematic reach was beginning to expand from the fast-paced, hooky choruses and upbeat love songs as they embraced deeper aspects of romance and philosophy. Of course, the controversy of drugs would play a part as well, thanks to the Beatles' now habitual use of marijuana. Even John called Rubber Soul the pot album, along with Ringo openly admitting that pot was influential in a lot of the band's changes, especially with the writing. Because they were writing different material, they were also playing differently. One of the standout tracks on Rubber Soul was George's introduction of the sitar in Norwegian Wood, This Bird Has Flown. This marked further progression outside of the traditional boundaries of popular music. As their lyrics grew more artful, fans began to study them for deeper meaning. While many of Rubber Soul's prominent songs were produced by Lennon and McCartney's collaborative songwriting, it was also an album that featured distinct compositions from each of the four band members. The Beatles would not be looked at as they once were, as Ringo referred this album to the departure record of their original sound. Paul would expand on that by saying, We had our cute period, and now it is time to expand. However, this was also one of the first times where people started to see a growing conflict within the group. It wasn't just them that had the conflict, it was all over, obviously with attitudes toward the Vietnam War. Still, the Beatles would continue to make music, and pretty soon, Beatlemania would transform into a true musical revolution. <laughs> As the Beatles continued to record, they were met with praise and controversy through themselves and their affiliates. Since 1963, Capitol Records had began issuing Beatles recordings for the U.S. market. They exercised complete control over the distinct U.S. albums from the band's recordings and issuing songs chosen by them for singles. In June of 1966, Yesterday and Today was one of Capitol's compilation albums, which caused an uproar with its cover, which portrayed the grinning Beatles dressed in butcher's overalls accompanied by raw meat and mutilated plastic baby dolls. It had been incorrectly suggested that it was a satirical response to the way Capitol had butchered the U.S. versions of their albums. During a tour in the Philippines, the Beatles unintentionally snubbed the nation's first lady, Emilda Marcos, who had expected them to attend a breakfast reception at the presidential palace. The resulted riots would eventually put the Beatles in danger and they would have to escape the country with difficulty. Immediately afterwards, they would embark on their first trip to India and they would meet with the legendary sitar player Ravi Shankar. It would then be their return to the UK in 1966, where the Beatles faced fierce backlash from a comment that Lennon had made in a March interview with a British reporter named Maureen Cleave. In the interview, John had said that in the current state of the world, the Beatles' music, among many others, were more popular than Jesus. While the UK paid no mind to John's words, it sparked tremendous controversy amongst the American Christian community. The anger even reached the Vatican, which issued a protest and bans on Beatles records. Brian Epstein accused the American magazine Datebook of twisting John's words out of context. At a press conference, Lennon would point out, If I had said that television was more popular than Jesus, I might have gotten away with it. Lennon claimed that he was just referring to how other people viewed their success. But in the end, he would issue an apology. In August of 1966, a week before the Beatles' final tour, they would release their seventh album, Revolver, another new sound showing the Beatles' ever-growing presence and talent in popular music. Revolver featured sophisticated songwriting, studio experimentation, and a variety of musical styles, ranging from classical string arrangements in Eleanor Rigby to psychedelic rock in Tomorrow Never Knows. The Beatles would also call upon an old friend from their days in Hamburg, Abandoning a customary group photograph, Revolver's cover was designed by Klaus Vormann, a stark, arty black-and-white collage that caricatured the Beatles in pen and ink. The album was preceded by the single Paperback Writer, backed by the B-side of Rain. However, to spark some other interest, during their U.S. tour that would follow, they performed none of the songs off of the new album. John's words about their music being bigger than religion 
could have proven them right, as preparations were made for the tour, the fans would do nothing at their concerts but scream at the top of their lungs, cry rivers, or even pass out at the sheer sight of any of the band members. This frustrated the band as they did not see the point of having a concert if the audience was just going to scream while their songs were being played and not even pay attention to the lyrics. Even going into bigger venues and using more powerful speakers, it just wasn't enough. The band's final concert at San Francisco's Candlestick Park on August 29th would be their last commercial concert. It marked the end of a four-year period dominated by almost non-stop touring that included over 1,400 concert appearances internationally. Life is very short. 1966 took the world into a full-blown time of turbulence and discovery. Change was all around, and the world continued to fight to progress forward. This was also the beginning of a new chapter in the Beatles' career, and with touring officially behind them, it was time for the Fab Four to do what they do best, offer the world something brand new and exciting. Only time will tell. 